everyone here. Mr. Bell, my understanding from my record is that you are here on behalf of the appellant. That being the case, I get to ask you the first question. How much time would you like to preserve for rebuttal? Uh, I would like to preserve four minutes, please, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. There are no other counsel that we need to transfer over. Do we have everybody? My understanding we have everybody. Okay. Then, counsel, you may proceed. Thank you. Um, may it please the court. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Brad Bell. I'm the attorney for the petitioner, City of Sarasota, and officers Jaimes and Arena. Um, this appeal involves the interpretation of three accepted proposals for settlement. Review by this court is de novo. Well, let uh, me ask you a question to get us started, Mr. Bell. Is the portion of the trial judge's order that you seek us to look at the one that says paragraph four? This settlement does not affect the remaining claims in this litigation of the survivors, the minors, or the minors? Uh, yes, it, it, it's, it's kind of all-encompassing, Your Honor. I mean, our proposal for settlement... Um, well, the... let, let me ask you a question. If it's just that section, tell me how we get jurisdiction. Because, one, it doesn't appear that there's any money yet decided. There's not an express ruling from the trial court about the legitimacy of any offer or settlement. And as to the other basis, um, there's nothing that says, as a matter of law, the proposal for settlement is unenforceable, set aside, or never existed. Rather, it says, let's go down the pike some more. So my question is, how do we have any jurisdiction on that non-final aspect by itself? And I guess the another part is, do we get it because you've repealed something else? But you won the other stuff, right? Um, Your Honor, we didn't win any of it. Um, the the proposals for settlement were intended to resolve the entirety of the litigation. And yeah, Lucas versus Calhoun to end judicial labor, not create more. Welcome to my world. Yes, Your Honor, um, precisely. Uh, and I, I believe you were uh, you were involved on that case, were you not? Yeah, you may say that I'm the the author. Yes, um, and uh, I believe we cited that. We also cited to the um, uh, Florida trucking case, which I know you were on the panel of. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't prevail on that theory, Judge. The dissent did. Um, yes. So, so Your Honor. Uh, my, our, my first question is, I need to make sure I know how we get jurisdiction. And the second question may be a subcomponent of it. As I understand, and I think Judge Kazam has an opinion that's been cited in here, when a personal representative brings a wrongful death suit, okay, you have submitted a, uh, on behalf of, I guess, the city, you have submitted offers or proposals of judgment. The statute says plaintiff and defendant. The beneficiaries fall into neither category. So how do they have any standing before us at all? Well, that's a lot of the issue. I'm sorry, the last part. Go ahead. Um, that's a lot of the issue here, Your Honor, um, that the alleged plaintiffs in this case, it wasn't just the personal representative of the estate of John Caffey. Um, they rolled in uh, a, a non-biological um, son um, or alleged son. They have the mother alleging that she has survivor rights as well. And in an effort to try to resolve all of these, well, illegitimate claims, quite frankly, we issued 12 proposals for settlement. And only three of those proposals for settlement were to the personal representative of the estate of John Caffey, who is truly the only plaintiff that could have brought this claim. And the amount of the proposals to the personal representative totaled 464000 of the total 500000 The remaining $6,000 was split up in nominal amounts to non-parties that we did not believe had independent standing. So completely to your point, but as I'm sure um, uh, all your honors know that, you know, when insurance companies settle cases, they don't want to pay defense counsel any more money. They want everything done. It's worth putting some money on the truly the plaintiffs, I'll do air quotes, that didn't have any standing to begin with. But the proposals were to the personal rep the the proposals with any substance that is were to the personal representative of the estate and those and those were accepted, were accepted right and the funds are in the trust account 
Correct. Those were accepted and those were in the trust account. And at that point, there is no more litigation. This case should be over pursuant to Florida trucking, where we had almost the same scenario where there was an early proposal <coughs> that was accepted. <coughs> and let's play the devil's advocate. Are we not here because the city set these non parties an offer of judgment, which they refused to accept? And now there's a there's a possibility that there exists that they have a, a claim until we get a final order from the judge that says they don't have a claim. There's nothing good for them to accept under 768 because they are neither a plaintiff nor a defendant. And under the existing case law, their only ability, as I understand, would go when the personal representative filed a claim for probate court approval of the settlement post for distribution. Am I on the right path? N no, Your Honor. That okay. Um, yeah. Out there, okay. Sorry. Okay. So what happened was the proposals for settlement. The the um, uh, plaintiffs below, respondents here, and the trial judge stated that those proposals that were accepted only applied to the loss of future net accumulations, which would be the estate's damages claims, and it did not apply to the one survivor's claim, which is YS, the biological son. So what the order and what the trial court said was, okay, this nearly half a million dollars is going to apply just to the loss of future income of Mr. Caffey does not apply to the survivor's claim. So in effect, the entirety of the case, instead of being settled, is going forward absent just the damages claim that the estate could have arguably made for the loss of net future accumulations by Mr. Cathy, which according to us is, is I mean, uh, um, clearly not proper. The, 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 the personal representative of the estate, and Your Honor, there were three proposals for settlement that were directed to the um, the personal representative of the estate. And like I said, those three totaled $464,000. Now, during this case, leading up to um, the drafting of these proposals for settlement, leading up to that, I mean, we had done discovery. Um, we had uh, requested any and all W-2s, tax returns, anything whatsoever that would establish any income or earnings of Mr. Caffey. And there was an objection and then a statement that they are not seeking any lost income. Also in discovery, we determined that the, well, not only did we determine that JS, the non-biological child who was never adopted by Mr. Caffey and Mr. Caffey was never uh, married to JS's mother, um, not only did we discover that he was not the biological child, but in going back through those records, discovered that Mr. Caffey, in the first 11 plus years of JS's life, had paid $50 in child support. So when we issued half a million dollars, yes. I realize I was muted. If I may, Mr. Bell, just push that aside. Aren't we here to look at the proposal? Yes. That you yes. drafted. Let's look at the actual, let's get rid of all this other extraneous stuff. Certainly, you know, certainly. You, you were the drafter, you prepared that proposal, and in each of those three that were accepted, all of them made reference to, to the estate of John Caffey. You could have added more. You didn't add more. All it made reference to estate of John Caffey. So I appreciate what you're saying about the discovery and what was done, but aren't we just bound, limited to what's before us? And what's before us are the three proposals that you drafted and it directs it to the estate of Caffey. Nothing more, nothing less. So I'm troubled with the fact that you're now asking us to inject, well, you know, should have, this should include this, this includes these others. I'm concerned about that. And I want to give you the opportunity to address my concerns. Thank you, Honor. Um, the, the proposals specifically state pursuant to Florida statute 768.79 and Florida rule of civil procedure 1.442 defendant city of Sarasota parens quote in bold city 
hereby makes the following proposal for settlement to plaintiff, comma, Joanne Sousey as the personal representative of the estate of John Caffey. It is then, quotes, or parens, quotes, and bolded. It's a defined term. And the defined term is Joanne Sousey as the personal representative of the estate of John Caffey. I mean, if you look at the proposals, it's not like there's a bunch of extra commas or, or anything in there. It is Joanne Sousey is the personal representative of the estate of John Caffey, and then I defined the term. And then that defined term, estate of Caffey, is used in every subsequent paragraph. So rather than rewriting Joanne Sousey as the personal representative of the estate of John Caffey in every subsequent paragraph, I used the defined term. Now, I defined that term, right, in, 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 the, in the document and, you know, the canons of, of uh, contract construction, which we cited to in our in our briefing, I mean, you know, defined terms are to be used in the contract. Now, when certainly, you know, if, if nothing else, certainly, you know, the opposing side can't take my defined term, say it means something else, and then hold that against me and, and, and say the definition um, only means loss of net accumulations and it doesn't, it wasn't actually a proposal for settlement to the personal representative, which it clearly was in this, I mean, the, the proposals and, and, you know, going through, I, I understand we need to stay within the four corners of the document. I 100% agree. And I appreciate it, Ms. Hunt. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if it was your position, no other claims would survive the estate's acceptance. Couldn't you have included that in your proposals? Well, the second paragraph of the proposals, it specifically states this proposal for settlement is to resolve any and all claims and damages that would otherwise be awarded in a final judgment, including any and all claims and causes of action giving rise to the above styled lawsuit brought by plaintiff, the state of Caffey, again, defined term, against defended city. And then likewise, the third paragraph, um, the total sum, which was $493,500 by the city, represents a full and final settlement of all claims and causes of action giving rise to the above styled lawsuit brought by plaintiff, the state of Caffey, again, a defined term against defendant city. So we believe we were being all encompassing in the drafting of these proposals um, for a significant amount of money, um, the I, I, I was certainly taken aback when you know the 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 position was taken that this is only for loss of net future income of Mr. Caffey when nothing in the record could have supported such. A belief. Um, the, the acceptances of the proposal attached our proposals, said that our proposals were accepted, and then, um, of course, 768.79 specifically says that, you know, proposals shall not be filed unless they're accepted. So we believe that they were abundantly clear in, in what we were doing and the amounts further, we believe, um, verified that fact in what it was that we were, we were resolving via these proposals for settlement. Um, again, uh, uh, you know, referencing briefly the, um, the Suarez trucking case, I mean, in that case, there was an offer and there was an acceptance and then, you know, there was in the payment, I believe there was an extra name put on the check, which, you know, they said this changes everything, you know, go on through trial, then through appeals and all the way up, only for the Supreme Court to say, no, way back when there was an offer, there was an acceptance. And that was it. That was the end. Your Honor, we believe that we have the same situation here. We made an offer. The defined term has to apply. If you remove the defined term and say that it means something else, 
then that's a, of course, it's going to mean something else. But the trial court below never referenced the defined term. The trial court below never, um, never said that the proposals were ambiguous. However, everything in the order, well, just about everything in the order that's referenced is all parole evidence. And all of the parole evidence was um, the, the, the title of the notices of service, say, a state of John Caffey, um, the, the redacted other proposals for settlement, which he didn't have the dollar amounts associated with them. All of that actually, it, it, it flows back to the fact that the, the only true proposals here that were accepted was the lump sum amount of $464,000, which um, was to then later be divvied up amongst the, um, um, well, really only provided to, quite frankly, the one true survivor. But for the fact that there were all of these other, and I'll put air quotes, plaintiffs listed in the in the complaint is, is the basis for all of these additional um, nominal value. I mean, there were nine of them for $6,000. They averaged out to about $660 a piece. But all of these other nominal proposals for settlement. This court obviously is not bound by the um, the reasoning or um, of the of the trial court. It is de novo review. We believe our proposals for settlement are are clear. Um, that the the defined term has to be applied. And I need to tell you, you're at sixteen. I'm at sixteen minutes. Yes. Thank you, Honor. Um, the defined term needs to be applied. And if the defined term is not applied, and if it is discarded at a, at a very minimum, um, there was no meeting of the minds here. And we should not be held to have to pay half a million dollars for a non-existent um, uh, loss of net future accumulations claim by the estate. Um, I would like to reserve the remainder of my time. Time up. Now, so you may respond. Uh, if it may please the court, Anthony Maganello on behalf of the plaintiffs. Uh, Your honors, what we have here um, is a case where a personal representative of the estate brought the wrongful death action, and within that wrongful death action, brought the claims of the three survivors and the estate. They sued three defendants, and what happened on or about August 31st, 2022, the defendants each sent four settlement offers. These settlement offers were filed, one directed to the estate, one directed to YS, one directed to JS, and one directed to Joanne Sousey. The notices of filing that filed these don't have any defined term. They're simply notice of service of proposal for settlement to plaintiff, the estate of John Coffey, the relevant notice. When you go to the proposal for settlement itself, the petitioner's nonsensical interpretation does not align with the four corners of the totality of the settlements that were provided. There wasn't, under petitioner's reasoning, they would have provided not 12, but 15. There would have been three more provided to just the, the claims for damages of the estate on top of these global settlements if these were truly global settlements, but there weren't. There were settlements provided to the estate, one set, those were accepted, to Joanne Sousey, JS, YS. No separate nominal set was sent to the um, estate separately from what these now purported for the first time to be global settlements. The clear and unequivocal language of the acceptances 
also unequivocally were only, uh, and this is this is um, reading from the notices of acceptance, the proposal for settlement and this acceptance settles all pending claims only between the estate of copy and the respective appellant um, for the three different offers. Our position is that the only way you can read the proposals for settlement in a way that makes sense in the context of the case is that those were meant to settle the claims of the estate and the others were meant to settle the claims for damages of the other survivors. There is, uh, the case law is clear that separate claims for damages of various survivors can be settled independently. Um, even if um, the court would find some question regarding looking just at the proposal itself, um, the court can um, and, and must look at the context of the entirety of the 12 settlement offers. Um, we cited hey, Anderson this, versus Counsel, Hilton. Yes, Your Honor. The, the operative complaint in this case is the uh, amended complaint? It is, Your Honor. Okay. Well, who is the plaintiff in that lawsuit? Your Honor, the plaintiff Your... is... The... Sorry, I was getting Sorry. feedback. The, the personal representative, representative is the is individual the bringing the individual. claims of the three survivors and the estate. The plaintiff is the personal representative, right? They have been given letters from the probate court to bring the lawsuit. Correct, Your Honor. So under 768, only the personal representative is a plaintiff. Is that right, by statute? Correct, Your Honor. I believe that is that is okay. true. And so the defendant, in this case, would be the city of Sarasota and the three police officers. Is that correct? The two police officers, yes, Your Honor. You know, right. Three, three people, three entities. Those would be the only parties that the statute would apply to. Is that correct? Your Honor, as far as the offer of judgment statute, yes. So if the purpose of the offer of judgment is to end this litigation, then the only entities by statute and by the pleadings that have any ability to argue are those that we have just listed, the PR and the three named defendants. And the only lawsuit that they can resolve is the one that's pending. All right. So Correct, the ch alleged children um, that are in this, the minor children, they would be required to go to the probate court to have their matter heard when it comes time to distribute the settlement asset? Well, Your Honor, the personal representative would have they the ability to... They don't have to... an individual claim, do they, that they're allowed by statute to bring? Or do they? Well, not uh, not derivative of them being a personal representative. In this case, the personal representative happens to also be a survivor. But the, the uh, minor children, J.S., and why yes, do they have any individual claim that they can bring? Not that they can bring, Your Honor. So, can, so they can't be a plaintiff or a defendant now or in the future? Correct, Your Honor. The personal representative has to bring their claims. So my, my question is, once the, the uh, personal representative accepted the offer of settlement, does that end everything except for the collateral proceeding in probate court for the distribution of the assets. No, Your Honor. If the Why? personal, because the personal representative is allowed to settle the individual claims of the survivors and the estate separate and apart from each other. The personal representative, which is why the fact that these settlements are directed to the personal representative that were accepted would make sense. The personal representative is the only one who can actually accept the settlement on behalf of either the estate or any of the three survivors. So the personal representative is the, the one above. Who, or all of the above. But again, there was no settlement offer made to all of the above. There was a settlement made to settle the claims of the estate, JS, YS, and Joanne. Those were the settlement offers that were made. And what was crystal clear, uh, and, and I was about to cite Anderson versus Hilton, uh, 202 Southern 3rd 835, you know, that that case, the um, the Supreme Court was very clear when there's multiple settlement offers being made at the same time, it considered the the totality of the circumstances of the settlement offers 
and talked about, um, you know, reading the entirety of the proposal, the only reasonable interpretation is that Troy Anderson offered to settle only his claims with each respondent. Uh, in this case, again, it was just the claims for damages of the estate that were settled, and that was expressly put forth in the acceptance. And the acceptance, again, was very clear. It was only the claims of the estate. Now, we believe that the only reasonable interpretation of the settlement, uh, particularly the only reasonable interpretation of the settlement in the context of the 12 settlement offers that were provided is that it was intended to settle the claims of the estate only. But even if the court were to take the arguments of the petitioner that somehow these were intended to settle all claims, the clear and equivocal language of the acceptance would such that would be such that it would create a counterclaim. And, you know, we cited a number of cases. So, so the argument line. would be that the language of the acceptance is in fact not an acceptance, it's a rejection and a counteroffer. Uh, well, Your Honor, again, that's not our argument because we believe that they, the offer was what it was. Let, but let if the offer- Another way to get to this point, yeah. the named children who arguably do or do not have a complaint under the existing statute are neither a plaintiff nor a defendant. So any offer of judgment to them because they are not a party, arguably in the statute, will be a nullity because they don't have the status required by the legislative language. The text of the statute says plaintiff or defendant, and they are neither. Correct, Your Honor. However, okay. and however, they can't bring in the arguably an independent lawsuit, can they? No, Your Honor. But the personal representative can settle their individual claims separately only in part from the others, which is what occurred here. The acceptance was crystal clear that the uh, acceptance was only to settle the claims of the uh, estate and, and, and the estate only. The, uh, and that was made by the personal representative who has the power to settle individual claims separately. Um, we cited Grant B. Lyons, but acceptances can turn into counteroffers either by adding additional terms or not meeting the terms of the original offer. Again, so I the think the language of the proposal for settlement is to settle all claims. And the response back is we, uh, we will accept it as to that claim, but as to no others, doesn't that seem to indicate a rejection and a counteroffer? Your Honor, again, if you assuming, take, that assuming the first know. half, assuming the yes. first half, yes, at that point, it is a counteroffer. That acceptance has been turned into a counteroffer. And the Which clear by record now has that, lapsed. Oh, sorry, Your Honor, if I could just finish. That. No, sorry. Go ahead. So just so the clear terms of the counter offer would have been for only the claims of the estate, which the personal representative can settle separately. The only response on the record from that is the checks in the mail uh, from the various defendants, the checks <laughs> that specifically reference claimant name, Kathy John Paul estate of. It was checks for the claims of the estate of John Paul Kathy in the note line and the settlement was effectuated. I'm following. Okay, so Your Honor, because of all of those reasons, um, we think it's clear that um, not only did a settlement occur to settle just the claims of, of the estate, but even, again, following the petitioner's arguments, then a counter offer would have occurred, which was which was unequivocally accepted. The settlement check that came in the mail didn't say settle all claims or you know accompany some sort of request for a final judgment. Uh, in fact, what happened was um, because the um, the um, there was a minor uh, who's the beneficiary of the estate, um, we put together a proposed order to send to the court to try to um, have the approval under the Florida wrongful death statute of claims that could potentially affect a, a, a minor. And we sent a proposed order. And the proposed order was, again, crystal clear that the only claims that had been settled were those of the estate and that the other claims of the survivors uh, were to go forward. The Response wasn't, hey, this was a global settlement offer meant to settle everybody's claims. The response was a red line that simply changed 
to the extent those claims can exist absent the estate of John Coffey, which again, takes their, which was a company with an email that said, it preserves our opinion that there are no remaining claims. We can argue it to the court later. The order further stated, and this was agreed to by the petitioners, that it was the, the order proving settlement, dismissing the claims of the estate of John Coffey with prejudice. It's just to settle the claims of John Coffey. Part C, it talks about the notices were only directed to the claims of the estate of John Coffey. Um, and we set it for hearing and we filed a memorandum discussing, well, claims can be settled separately and apart by the personal representative. Um, and just because the claims of the estate may settle doesn't mean it settled the other claims and the other claims should go forward. It was only then right before the hearing that the petitioners took the position that that was intended to settle all the claims. And again, this position resulted in the court actually having a second hearing on it um, so that uh, the court could you know, fully appreciate the new arguments that took place. And the court made some very clear findings. Um, the court found that um, in its order that um, the court finds that the estate and the defendant settled only those claims brought by the estate um, and that this determination has no bearing on the other remaining claims and that the settlement uh, was exactly what the settlement was, said it was. It was a settlement to settle the uh, claims of the estate. Um, the, I would like to just address briefly the argument that was made in the reply by the petitioners, um, somehow trying to create an overly narrow and convoluted definition of claim. Claim can mean a lawsuit, but claim also can mean a claim for damages. Um, you know, we just discussed the you know petitioner's check that they sent to accept uh, the settlement, and it specifically referenced the claim of the estate of John Coffey. Again, the survivors and the estate uh, each have their own claims for damages. Um, the term claim isn't defined in the Florida wrongful Let death statute or somehow restricted question. to the lawsuit itself. I'm sorry, Your Honor. With, with regard to your, the, the argument that's coming, as we interpret a statute and its corresponding rule, determine the validity of a proposal for settlement or offer of settlement, does it really matter what the check says? Or are we limited to the language of the rule and the language of the statute? Your Honor, I don't believe you're limited to the language of the rule and or the language of the statute. Because again, if for whatever reason, this acceptance was not an acceptance of the offer as the petitioners now claim, it served as a obvious counter offer to settle the case one that was accepted by the sending of a check. Um, again, it's obviously not a counteroffer under the statute um, at that point. It's not an offer of judgment that I could use later to try to get attorney's fees if, in fact, the court determined it wasn't just an acceptance of what it said it was. Um, but it's it, it obviously can and did serve as a counteroffer settlement, which the court found. Um, and because the fact that settlement offer was accepted uh, unequivocally, and again, the acceptance itself specifically referenced just and only claims of the estate. Um, again, when the court's looking at what actually the settlements were, um, that in and of itself is a separate distinct settlement counter offer and acceptance. Again, would not be upheld under the offer of judgment statute for attorney's fees or something, um, but certainly uh, could and did serve as a counter offer if somehow these offers really were to settle all the claims. When you look at the 12 separate settlement offers, again, the only reading of those that makes any sense are there to do what they say they're to do, to settle the claims of the state, to settle the claims of JS, to settle the claims of YS, and to settle the claims of uh, the mother, Joanne Sousey. And the only uh, claims that were settled by the settlement were those of the estate. And if the uh, court has uh, no further questions, we'll rely on the arguments set forth in our breach, our uh, 
and would request that the lower court's order be affirmed. Thank you. Let me ask this while you both still have some time available. Very often, we as attorneys and judges go back to first year law school. And we use contractual law terminology. My concern with the statute, this is not a contract in the sense of the tradition. This is not a voluntary undertaking to reach something. This is a statute that puts you at a compulsion. If you don't do this, you will get stuck with attorney fees. So when we interpret this, is it appropriate sometimes to bring in import, if you will, contractual language when that normally talks about a voluntary meeting of the minds or the objective saying of the same things when there's nothing here that's voluntary except for the party that makes the initial proposal. And yeah, that I, is the thing is I go through these cases wondering, is it safe to import those concepts? There doesn't seem to be said yes or no yet. And I was wondering if you've seen something differently. No, yeah, I think you absolutely have to incorporate the concepts of contractual acceptance and denial. This analysis doesn't turn on whether or not you're meeting the technical requirements of the statute in order to enforce an offer of judgment for attorney's fees. This, qu this question is clearly what was the offer and what was the acceptance? And that the case law has been clear on is, is, is you know, something that the court follows contractual uh, guidance and contractual interpretation on. So again, we're not talking about an anal analysis of compliance with the statute. We're talking about what was the offer and what was the acceptance? And when that's the question, which is the question before the court, um, the See, I thought we were talking about compliance with the statute because the failure to do it right exposes you to attorney fees. So I thought we were talking about compliance with the terms of the statute. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about role. We're talking about whether or not a settlement offer was made to settle Correct. either got, all got, of the claims okay. or whether it was made to settle just the claims of the estate. Gotcha. I got that it. Is I the, got that is the question that's before the court. Did that settlement offer offer to settle? Every claim brought by every survivor in the estate, you know, despite the fact there were 12 total sent and all the other ones were offered, or did that, as as the court found, the ones that said were to settle the claims for the estate, guess what? Those were the ones that were to settle the claims for the estate, and the other ones that were rejected, guess what? Those were the ones that were sent to settle those other claims, which still continue on in the case. That's the question before the court, um, and again, Further question would be before the court if for some reason they follow the petitioner's argument. Um, again, the obvious clear language of the acceptance would then be converted into a counteroffer, which was also accepted. And in any event, uh, the court's underlying opinion should be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your responses. And Mr. Bell, um, we'll go to you for a rebuttal since I let counsel go a little bit longer. You'll back up to your four minutes. I think you're muted, sir. You're muted. Sorry about That's that. Thank Don't you. worry, I do it all the time. I do, I do it regularly. So a couple things real quick. First and foremost, I want to jump to um, Mr. Manginello was addressing, you know, after the fact when we were talking about the um, uh, drafting of the of the actual settlement agreement. And as he stated, our first response to that was our position is that there are no surviving claims. So to make the allegation that, oh, for the first time during these hearings that we come up with this new argument that there's no surviving claims is simply not true. Um, Mr. Manginello and I had had numerous settlement discussions prior to the um the proposals for settlement even going out there's we tried to do a a motion for rehearing reconsideration we requested that this court actually relinquish jurisdiction um we did we filed um you know uh, additional documentation associated with that the trial court found that it was not new evidence and it shouldn't be uh, um reviewed because it constitutes parole evidence however Everything that the judge relied on below was parole evidence. The 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 redacted other proposals for settlement, the um, the title of the notices of service, etc. Now, the idea that this was somehow 
a a counter offer that was then accepted um that your honor should not be condoned by this court the acceptances specifically state hereby accepts accepts is underlined they then attached our proposals for settlement and 768.79 says you cannot file a proposal unless it's accepted so to do all of those things and then say broadcasting it's accepted oh and by the way in those acceptances they use the term exactly as we defined it in our proposals Peren, quote, estate of Kathy. So if that was intended somehow to be a, a counteroffer, that is sleight of hand, and that should not be condoned by this court. The only way that the respondent's argument and the trial court's ruling can survive is if the defined term is disregarded. And the defined term, a state of CAFI, was defined, Joanne Sousey, as personal representative of the estate of CAFI. If that is thrown out, then of course it's going to change how the proposal is read. And if that is thrown out, then there was no meeting of the minds at a minimum because we knew what we meant when we defined the term. And that shouldn't now be held against us with a different definition. Um, also, I mean, there's background stuff, obviously, that 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 happens in these. And, and you know, when Mr. Manginello is reading those 12 proposals, as stated, there's only the ones to the, to the personal representative are the only ones of any substance whatsoever. $464,000. They know what their discovery responses were, that there was no net income, um, no there, that he they had no evidence of any income for Mr. Caffey, and they said that they were not seeking any future lost income claim, which is exactly what and only thing that the estate could recover. We believe that the trial court's order should be reversed we believe that this case um, should be um, resolved in our favor as once those proposals were accepted and at a very minimum that there should be a determination based on this court's de novo review that there was no meeting of the minds between the parties and that the money which is currently sitting in trust should be returned to the city and the two officers. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and on behalf of the court, thank you all. Appreciate the way you responded to all the questions, giving us your points of view and, and your experience. It's very much appreciated. Um, as you are the last case on the docket today, I can't invite you to hear any more.